So um, basically, um, Fiona and I um, have a studio, um, as Rebecca said, and we've also been heavily involved in teaching for most of our careers over the last 20 years or so. So there's a very strong interaction between um, what we do and what our students do. And we tend to see our work really as a set of experiments to test out different ways of designing it and different contexts and, and even different kinds of partnerships. Sometimes that feeds into the program that we teach at the RCA and then the students come back and sort of challenge us with their interpretations and discoveries and there's a kind of a loop. I think overall we're sort of really I suppose design is our subject, that's what we're investigating. It just The topics we take really are just elements that allow us to test out different approaches. I'm going to um, show a li little bit of some recent work we've been working on after a bit of context and then um, some student projects that um, have come out of the program as well. So um, we're coming very much from a design background and uh, when it comes to technology, the sort of context for us is all about futures. And of course, as a designer, no matter what you do, you are always thinking about the future, even if it's just one or two years um, ahead. But certainly our, most of our training is um, orientated towards probable futures. Um, the way that we're trained, the awards, the methodologies, the educational system are all based on trying to figure out and look for seeds in the present that are going to tell us what kind of futures um, emerging. And we're kind of stuck in this, I think, very narrow um, interpretation of reality, the sort of the here and the now. So around that's a slightly broader context of um, potential futures, the sort of thing that maybe started to happen in the 70s when companies like Shell developed really large geopolitical scenarios for how the world was going to unfold under maybe 20 or 30 years to ensure that their company could survive in a number of different large-scale scenarios. But again, it was very much looking at what's likely to happen, you know, extensions of the world with slight um, deviations in different directions. And around that really is the idea of possible futures, which I think is where a lot of fiction, sci-fi, cinema, um, this sort of stuff happens. And I guess this is the space that we're most interested in. It's um, trying to step away from extrapolating from the present now and possibly looking at alternative futures, counterfactual realities, or alternative nows and so on. And I think the only rule we have in this space is to stick with the laws of physics and um, not to get into fantasy where you start to have teleportation and so on, but to say we abide by the physical rules of, of how things work, but everything else, ethics, psychology, economics, politics, all these things are up for grabs and can be manipulated and experimented with. But the reason we do this is to try and figure out what preferable futures are. So we're constantly confronted with the futures offered to us mainly through tech industry and think tanks with, uh, of course, agendas. And we want to see design as a catalyst for generating, not necessarily us as designers saying, here's what we think alternative futures could be, but using design to spark um, different um, ideas of what the future could be like, whether it's with the public or scientists or um, other sort of people outside of the tech industry. And we do this really by um, scattering ourselves all over these different spaces and often teaming up with other specialists, ethicists, e economists, political theorists, and so on, to try and use design to bring together ideas in a very tangible and concrete way. So most of our outcome ends up in exhibitions. It's a kind of interface for us with the public space. I, I don't know about America, but in the UK, most um, museums are still free, so they are accessible, and they're increasingly creating um, sort of um, interactive and exploratory lab elements to them. This is um, just some shots of some projects from our department that were in the Talk to Me exhibition at uh, MoMA last year. And once they get into exhibitions, they tend to circulate um, from there. And um, we also work a lot with scientists. This is a project from a few years ago where we were asked by the, fund the government's main funding body for engineering and physical sciences research in the UK, they, they manage about three quarters of a billion pounds a year, um, to connect designers to 16 um, research centers um, around the UK, dealing with everything from quantum computing to synthetic biology to nuclear energy, and see um, what design could bring to, to those researchers and then bring those interpretations into a public space to have um, discussions again and debates about alternative futures. So I'm going to talk about a project we just did um, in the last year or so for the Design Museum in London. And um, a lot of the, start really the starting point for our projects mainly are our values, how we see the world. 
So we spent a lot of time trying to develop um, alternative values, different priorities, hopes, dreams, fears, anxieties, and um, try to articulate those into briefs. And then around those, we build alternative imaginaries or worlds or, or contexts. Um, we try to design them as though that was a brief, as though that was um, an imaginary client or a context. So our design methods are quite straightforward, and I'd say even traditional, but we try to apply that to a much more imaginary space. And then we bring those artifacts, they're usually artifacts, they can be prototypes or environments as well, back to the here and now in the form of exhibitions and present them in ways that we hope that people can sort of reverse engineer them. They can look at these objects and wonder what kind of political realities or um, cultures would give rise to such things and start to compare them to our own world. So it's kind of like a reverse archaeology. Instead of looking at ancient artifacts and trying to piece together the worlds they came from, we try to use them to piece together ideas about alternative realities. It's sort of a, a bottom-up kind of approach. Um, uh, th I was here at mainly for, for an event at the weekend around world building, and I think what we do is more like world hinting. We, want, we don't want to show people our world, but use bits of it to hint and, I guess, encourage people to imagine their own alternatives. So um, we came across these books um, a couple of years ago from a German publisher called Sternberg, where they ask writers to imagine, reimagine countries. Um, so the second on the left at the top there, the solution series, is a fairly practical but interesting reimagination of Finland, looking at welfare and education, the tourism and so on. Whereas the one next to it on the left, Every Lie Creates a Parallel World, is a book about 100 different Scotlands, ranging from the absolutely mad to the kind of believable. And we really like the idea that there was a boldness to just taking a country and not worrying about how simple it's going to have to be, but reimagining it and offering that as um, a, a start of a conversation. So we wanted to do our own version um, as designers rather than writers and um, took the UK and imagined a devolved version called the United Micro Kingdoms. So it's not just about Scotland and Wales and breaking away, but England itself and breaking down into smaller sections. And um, we had to, again, start somewhere with values. And one of the things we wanted to do with this project was not to offer one view, which could be dystopian or utopian or a mix, um, but to set up a number of different alternatives that could work together, um, none of which were either clearly utopian or dystopian. And to try and talk a little bit through our design about how technologies itself uh, themselves are entangled with politics and ideologies and you know a, a communist version of digital technology is going to be very different from a hyper capitalist one and to try and broaden the conversation away from just thinking about technological futures to how we also need to think about the political frameworks around those technologies so this is um, something that um, we didn't create it's a fairly standard classic axis um, by an organization called uh, politicalcompass.org and you have the usual kind of economic um, state control on the left, free markets on the right, and then authoritarian versus a libertarian, or I'd say maybe liberal at the bottom. And uh, when you go online, um, there's a massive questionnaire you can fill out, and it positions you on a chart like this. And you can see that most of the kind of Western governments, you can also look back at, at snapshots historically and see they're kind of drifting up to the top right. And when we filled it out and our students fill it out, we always tend to be in the bottom left um, quadrant, somewhere around the Dalai Lama or Nelson Mandela. And you can see the kind of problem, if that's where we are as designers, yet the reality we're designing for is up there in the top right. Um, it's no wonder um, there's a lot of tension and uh, a gap between um, the idealism of us as designers and uh, the kind of realities that we're, we're dealing with. So we um, filled out our own um, version of that just as a kind of a starting point, really, to get us going. So on the top right, we have um, an extreme version of the current market-driven democratic system combined with digital technologies. On the top left, um, nuclear energy and some kind of socialist um, way of organizing things. On the bottom left, uh, biotechnology and maybe a social democratic um, sort of model. And on the right, uh, bottom right, anarchy and self-experimentation. So we wanted to just set up, you know, not that we think these are legitimate or valid ways of, of existing, but it's kind of artificial, like a thought experiment to see what happens when we start to design for these four different quadrants and what do they 
what can they tell us about technology, politics, and design, and how they interact? So we sketched out each one in very basic sort of synopsis, just to get the essence of uh, what they're about. This one is for the digitarians. The state itself is, in, is an invisible totalitarian state with an illusion of the state serving its people, but the opposite is true. Um, another illusion of choice and freedom. And everything's in the service of industry, even our leisure. And the citizens have a kind of a deluded existence. We worked out some of those for each of the groups and then made a fairly simple st um, matrix where we tried to figure out some of the key defining factors. So for example, if you look at nature, the digitarians just use it up as necessary. Um, the communal nucleus try to geoengineer and modify the environment to their needs. The bioliberals use genetic technologies to create a sort of symbiotic relationship to nature. And the anarcho-Darwinists turn technologies on themselves to modify themselves to fit within the limits of the environment they find themselves in. And then each state, in a way, or each organization has to have a promise that unites and focuses its citizens. So for the digitarians, it's choice. For the communal nuclearists, it's protection. For the bioliberals, it's um, individuality in relation to nature. And for the anarcho-Darwinists, it's complete autonomy. And each of those, of course, come with costs and opportunities as well. So f we worked with political sci a political scientist on this, but there's you reach a point in these projects where you go, do you want to be a political scientist and come up with a really complex uh, theory of how society could be reorganized, or do you want to come up with a brief, which is just enough to sort of spark your imagination and then lead to some designs? And it's always very difficult to figure out where that point is. We did try to locate these communities in England, but it all kind of went wrong there for a while. And once you start to say a certain part of England, say is um, where the digitarians are, you, you have to start figuring out how do we get to that point? Why is it that part of England? And it becomes a little bit too real and starts to come back against the thing we were trying to avoid, um, an extension of today's England. So we, um, the only thing that did come out of it was the communal nuclearists being dependent on nuclear energy wouldn't have a fixed location because nobody would want to be next to them. So that green part is, a, is um, a zone where they have a mobile state that travels around um, and never stops. We kind of took that bit and then left the, the map uh, go. So with each of the um, zones, we needed something that we could design that would start to express and manifest their values. And we focused on transport systems. And one of the reasons we did this was that throughout the 20th century, the car, at least, has, has been a kind of a vehicle for dreams about individuality and, and freedom and so on. We, we could take that dream and drop it into each of these quadrants and see what happens to it and how it changes. And also, transport systems, besides being able to relate to them, even when you confront a train or a car or a bicycle, you immediately start to think of the infrastructure and the fuel systems and technologies behind them. So you can deal, by implication, with the large scale as well as the one-to-one -one scale of the, of the thing we're designing. We also liked how historically, often in world fairs and these festivals of, of different futures, the vehicle was often there to somehow represent different ideas of, of how the future would unfold. So I'll start with the digitarians. And uh, the vehicle for them is um, a driverless car, um, not too, uh, you know, too surprising. Um, Basically, we looked a lot at, at the kind of Im imagery and uh, ambitions that are being presented at the moment for these sorts of vehicles. And they tend to be quite utopian. You know, they're portrayed like this, very relaxing environments. Um, you can surf, I don't know, relax on the way to work. There's never really other cars in the picture, so somehow they're suggesting a very isolated and maybe even utopian um, existence. And uh, we started to think, well, if you look at the current economic and political system and then kind of exaggerate that, Really, this is going to probably present opportunities for monetizing something and maximizing um, income generation. So we started to make an analogy with the um, telecommunications spectrum, where in the UK, the government um, sells off parts of the spectrum to different companies who then lease it to us as consumers. So maybe the roads would become like the spectrum, where the government would make them available to Apple or Google or Amazon or Hertz, and they then would create a tariff system so that us as consumers could access um, you know, meters per squared of the road 
for seconds and everything would be calculated around that. Um, so rather than conventional dashboards with sp speed and fuel consumption, they might be much more about uh, money and time. And the decisions you're making and the feedback the dashboard offers you is how to navigate a tariff landscape. And we developed um, three fairly straightforward tariffs that are, are meant to be quite difficult. I, I don't know what it's like um, buying a phone in the US, but if you buy one in the UK, you're, you're bombarded with uh, complex and contradictory schemes. So they have choices, like if you have a one-passenger car, you can go for a small car, no windows, um, stops three times a day, um, you have a certain amount of priority, um, no peak travel, one hour um, off peak. And each of those, as you add more and more payments, you um, gradually um, basically get more and more freedom. So the cars themselves are um, not meant to be very sexy or um, consumers. They're more like appliances, uh, fridges, um, juices, and things like that. And they're each um, developed around different um, tariffs. So the base unit has a very small footprint, made even smaller by the fact you, you stand up, because that's the expensive thing, is how much road you take up. Um, it's forward facing, which is good. It, you can do some work on the way to work. Um, a two-person one reduces the cost, but someone has to have priority over whether they get dropped off first or second. Um, the front facing is probably a little bit more expensive than the rear facing. There's greater reduction of cost by sharing with four people. This one, you're both front facing, which is a bit more expensive, but by having separate compartments, you've increased pr um, privacy, which again is a bit more expensive, but by sharing, you, you can keep the cost down. And they kind of look something like this, kind of uh, toy-like, uh, candy-colored sort of cars that on the surface suggest lots of choice and opportunity to express your individuality. But of course, underneath it, there's a, a highly kind of manipulative um, system. And we worked with um, an animator to try and look, like, look a little bit at how this system might work if cars are being um, controlled um, autonomously. And of course, at, at, at first, it makes a lot of sense. If you've got a limited resource like the road, you can, you know, you can maximize the usage of that road for safety, for convenience. You can space the cars to make it more enjoyable. Or you can see it as a, as a source of income and use the algorithms to optimize the money-generating potential of the system. We became very interested in if, you know, normally at a junction like that, you either have signs that determine who has right of way, or you make eye contact and kind of negotiate with the other drivers if it's small scale. But once everything's being controlled by algorithms, how are those decisions made? What kind of values inform those decisions? And uh, we became very interested in that and how whether design can even play a role in that sort of discussion. So we started to think that, like air flight, you'd have the kind of easy jets and cheap carriers at one extreme, and then you'd have the sort of business class um, travel at the other. And the algorithm could potentially be used to make this amazing journey um, through the landscape, but we're quite pessimistic and think it's going to be used instead to kind of stratify us into different uh, layers of affordability. This is a glimpse of the Digiland, um, a completely tarmacked um, landscape, where even though um, they have freedom, they're in columns. And there's little bits of nature left over, but they don't really know uh, what to do with those. So the second one I want to talk about is the biocar. And when um, bio vehicles or biofuels are presented at the moment, they, they, like this is um, suggesting that maybe um, algae could be used um, as an alternative fuel. Um, but the car itself is still presented as a kind of dreamlike um, supercar. So even though the fuel might change, in a way, nothing else changes. But when um, these cars are actually prototyped, you end up with something more like this. This is a, um, an electric fuel cell, a hydrogen um, electric fuel cell powered car from a few years ago by Mercedes. And it's becoming much more like a bicycle or a carriage. And the whole idea, once you move away from combustion engines and, and fuels that have taken million year of years to compress energy into them, you, you just can't compete. Everything's going to slow down. And so these things travel, I think, at about four miles an hour. And so we're very interested in working around the idea that the bioliberals accept this, that things like streamlining and speed would just seem ridiculous to them. 
and there are other kinds of values that they, they prefer to embed in their transport. We're wondering what a, a biological car should look like. Um, should it have a digestive system instead of an engine? And um, eventually came up with something like this, where there'd be a, a fermenter that takes organic waste and produces gas, and then the gas could be used in a, a fuel cell, so it's kind of more like a hybrid. And we became very interested in this cover and what that could be made of to suggest that these things are in some way um, biological or organic. And uh, one of our students had been working with um, kombucha to um, develop forms. We decided to um, commission him to, to develop some of the envelopes for this car. So on the right-hand side are, are some experiments from another designer called Suzanne Lee, who's developed this material for clothing, but treats it very much as, as flat sheets that would need to be pattern cut in a traditional way. Where Stefan's work up in the top uh, middle there was looking at how you could grow and create um, three-dimensional objects from kombucha. And, and hence, that's, that's why he was interested in um, this project. So he um, set up this little system for um, experimenting with different sizes and volumes and thicknesses and so on. And after about 10 days, you get this sort of thing on the bottom left-hand side, quite thick, about five millimeters thick. And after another few days out of the um, juices, you end up on the bottom right-hand side there with something that's almost paper thin, very delicate, almost skin-like. And these... Uh, were kind of used in this way. And just before the exhibition, and one of them, they're so, they're so light, if you just breathe on them, they take off. And in fact, in the exhibition, they were in an acrylic case, and when they were cleaning the cases, the static would lift them off the cars, which was causing real problems. But this one blew off our desk and um, got ripped, and we had to get Stefan to come from Germany with his kombucha repair kit and sort of seal up the scar. And it was quite nice in the exhibition that you could see the scar in a kind of a, a patch over it. And it suggested, again, a very different way of um, living with objects and, and dealing with decay. And we're also interested in, in hinting at a world where these might exist, but not trying to say it's a future necessarily. So this could be the present, it could be us just presenting our, our project. It could be curators in another time looking at a failed project that never happened um, and discussing these artifacts, or it could be the inventor hoping to propose it. And we're very interested in, when you start to visually represent futures, what kind of um, languages you use and what kind of props and so on to, to escape the sort of, you know, this extension of the present. And this is, the end of the you know, this is where we get interested in, in designing for not here and not now. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the future, it's just elsewhere. So the last one of these I'll mention is the Camino Nucleus train. So at the beginning, we, we thought of these in a quite cliched way, you know, living in overcrowded conditions on a massive block that um, traveled around the country. And um, we had a little trip to a Joshua tree uh, while we were doing the project. And we saw the homesteading that was going on out in Wonder Valley. And this kind of idea that maybe you could have a little piece of utopia on the train and rather than it being um, uh, you know, communists or socialists in a very negative way. It could be that everyone's sharing the limited freedom that's been provided by nuclear energy to have their own bit of utopia. So the train, the state became a, a train, a very large scale train with platforms with um, almost like different plots of land. So each one would be about 20 by 40 meters and it would need two sets of tracks uh, about three meters wide each. And um, started to evolve more into plots with small huts that later became huts that people could share rather than live in. And most of the people would live in the landscape um, within it, which wouldn't be earth and grass, but uh, artificial. And in most of our projects, we work with experts and engineers to try and make sure they're plausible. But I like this um, summary of, of what um, David Kirby talks about in his book on, on how um, scientists and experts advise filmmakers that the role of the expert is not to prevent the impossible, um, but to make it acceptable. And that's something we try to do. We're not trying to escape reality and make um, completely non-feasible mechanisms. We want them to be feasible, but maybe the economics or the will isn't there at the moment to make them happen. So, we, um, so, so with this train, so if you look to those wheels, they, they'd be about 1.5 meters high. So it's quite a large um, structure. And it'd be about um, three and a half kilometers long. 
It has its own nuclear reactor, which would be a thorium reactor, which is uh, far safer than uranium ones. Closer, we rapid um, 3D printed the train and the some of the huts. Here's some shots from the exhibition. And here it is traveling through the Lake District in the UK and in the exhibition. So we've been using this project as a, a platform since to try and um, develop other projects and ideas and conversations um, out of it. I'm just going to go through. Um, a few um, quick bits and pieces that are in progress at the moment. So for um, an exhibition that we've been working on in, in Turkey, um, we wanted to take the idea of the UMK and work with an illustrator to try and show not just what the objects would be like, but maybe what the, the s scenes, the lives, the, the events that would define that culture would be like. So this is a scene in, in the bioliberal landscape where there's a kind of comfortableness with everything that we would regard as pretty disgusting awful and you know organs and waste and debris and decomposing things are somehow just part of their life and they've been vis visited by the um, digitarians the bioliberals would outsource all their experimentation bioexperimentation to the um, anarcho evolutionists who are very happy to experiment on themselves as long as it isn't forced and if it's your own personal choice and you're willing to take the risks um, that's fine Here's a view from inside the carriage of the train. It's more like a, a cinematic experience. Um, rather than just a highly functional control room, it might be a library or a place where you look at paintings that idealize. They, you know, they live on the train. They never enter the, nat the nature that they're always passing through. So for them, nature has this remote and, and mysterious quality. And then um, a protest in Digiland, where they're um, ripping off the sleeves from their jackets with their wearable technologies and them. Um, as a protest of so much emphasis on the on not being here and now but always being mentally and psychologically and emotionally somewhere else and we basically worked on about 20 um, illustrations for this project it was quite interesting trying to choose what events would lend themselves to some kind of um, scene rather than um, a design development Um, this is one for um, a, a very small project we just did over a few weeks over the summer where it was for an exhibition at an art centre in uh, Belgium called Z33 doing an exhibition about um, the future of the future which they called Future Fictions and uh, they asked us to try and you know, come up with some project that contributed to um, this sort of discussion. And we were very interested in, um, in two things, how futures are presented through cinema and especially the interactive elements and the interfaces and technological products and also where you go after after these things if everything's been minimized and reduced to a surface what um, future is there for design can we see a return of um, three-dimensionality for example we also wanted to step away from trying to communicate um, precise functions and use these objects to maybe open up um, spaces so each of them is um, some kind of modified computer rendering, um, a photograph of a real space, and then a title. This one's just called um, an Athiculator. This one is uh, a Publi voice. This one's a, a data boundary logger. And this one is um, a ticket machine with a human inside it. I've forgotten the actual name. <laughs> so they're all um, pr just presented as prints um, in the exhibition. And uh, there's, you can't see it on, the, on these images, but there's different levels of fine information as you get closer and closer. So standing right alongside it, there's one layer. And as you step away, you see them in another thing. We're very interested in trying to, with the Design Museum project, it was very much about trying to communicate certain values. And with the work we're doing at the moment, we're trying to move away from that into a much more ambiguous space where the objects really are just prompts to try and trigger or spark um, reflections on technologies. We're also very interested in if we take the conductive films and technologies and sensor fields and so on being developed around current interfaces, but rather than compressing them into planes, started to construct three-dimensional volumes, where would that lead uh, from a design and aesthetic point of view? Okay, I'm just going to jump to some student 
projects now. So um, on the program, um, it's a two-year MA, I think probably like your graduate program, we take um, students from all sorts of backgrounds, mainly art and design, but also uh, people might have done anthropology or economics or computer science as well. And we try to set up a space where people can figure out what their relationship to technology and its impact on society is. Some people end up going down a more industry route and working usually in the research parts of companies like Apple or Google or, or Intel or Microsoft, but never really at the product end. Um, a big chunk of them set up their own studios and try and create new ways of doing design. And another group end up, I'd say, almost down the kind of media art direction, uh, participating in festivals, doing residencies, and looking for uh, funding, that kind of existence. We like the fact in our studio, we only have about 18 students per year, all these different perspectives and different value systems are rubbing up against each other and producing the work that, that comes out of the department. So it's a very um, free space. This is a letter I got um, about a year ago um, from our registrar. Um, and the students are always, and we're, very, we're next door to um, Imperial College, which is, a, I guess like you, being part of UCLA, it's an, an incredible um, science and technology, um, world-class sort of university, but it causes lots of trouble for us because the students have access to all sorts of amazing things. So we're constantly in dialogue um, with the uh, health and safety department there, trying to negotiate uh, and figure out stuff. Um, just go through about three or four projects. Um, Recently, the students have been, traditionally we started as a, an interaction design program. It was set up in the 90s by Gillian Crampton Smith. And around the mid-2000s, the college was starting to wonder whether we should even have an interaction design program because textiles were doing it, product design, fine art. What exactly was our department um, providing? So they asked people to make proposals about the future of the department, and I suggested that we broaden the technological remit to include um, the science as well. And they're super enthusiastic about this, so we're able to redefine the curriculum, basically hire new staff, and, and relaunch the course as a kind of much broader, and we t you know, hence we called it Design Interactions, to suggest it's still part of that world, but we're literally designing interactions not just with technology, but between designers and scientists, the present and the future, between different disciplines. And um, one of the things working with the scientists did was pulled us out of the present into, the, into research that was fine in a laboratory but was a long way off from being realized in everyday life. So we ended up having to adopt a more speculative approach. And that's then started to feed back into the way we also approach them, digital technologies and, and, and other things. And one of the things we've started to see recently is this mashup, I guess, of all these different elements. So this project was just done in the degree show this year, 2014. And um, it started from a synthetic biology project we run in first year for a few weeks where st um, our students and scientists work together, starting with a hands-on um, bio work, hacking workshop to develop ideas around um, synthetic biology. And he eventually developed it into a story where a family, a very wealthy family, in order to secure its wealth down the generations, developed its own um, space probe, which it can use to um, seed um, a distant planet with um, micro bacteria that have been modified to respond to different chemical d uh, mineral deposits in the land. That's something that is, is possible now. You can redesign bacteria to take an input and change color. So these bacteria would spread around the, the planet and pro provide some kind of indication of, of the potential for mining. And this is um, the start of the story where they each generation would receive the letter when the older generation dies, telling them, introducing them to the interface and uh, telling them of their duties. Um, so this probe would be traveling through space for maybe several hundred years. And um, there'd be a timetable of telling them at which points in the future, maybe every decade or more, a signal would be sent that they need to register and log to check the mission is still on. And then they just plot um, the progress in this kind of more antique um, piece of furniture. This um, project from the year before is um, by Benedict Gross. Um, looked at the idea of um, how technology and landscapes um, interact. And he was fascinated by how the landscapes, you know, they communicate political and economic systems in the way they're organized. And wondered, looking at these trends of um, 
farming becoming a digital activity. Um, in Europe, there's a lot of incentives to move away from producing foods to producing biofuels. And um, also the kind of subsidies for farmers are changing as well. If we fast forward to these three things, how might the landscape of Europe begin to change? And um, he managed to persuade um, a duke in Germany to give him a field, um, you see it's 920 meters long, 320 meters wide, that he could experiment with. And there was a university nearby with various uh, farm equipment that he could borrow and hack and reprogram to do his experiment. And he um, basically, <laughs> he basically wanted to look at how he called it digital um, landscape um, printing if he could develop an algorithm for optimizing all these factors and coming up with a new design for fields that would reflect this uh, future for European um, farming landscapes. So he, um, if I just skip, well, I'll leave it well in the background. So basically, he looked at, um, rather than using pesticides, if you have a certain size field and plant um, non, because it's biofuels, you can just basically process everything and uh, don't have to worry about whether it's um, edible or not. So you can mix different types of um, um, plants and so on, and one of them would attract um, insects that would kind of act as insecticides. And this gave rise to a certain size of field, which you'll see in a minute, that then determined the whole layout. So he's digitized um, the field. And came up with this sort of land, this these kind of cellular sizes, which were optimized. Which it turned out later on were the size that many uh, medieval fields were in, in that part of Germany as well. Oops. And uh, he worked with the farmer then to. Sorry. So I don't know why that's happening. I don't know why that's happening, sorry. So basically, he worked with the farmer to then program the tractor into a kind of a seed printer that printed um, the crops and the other plants in this sort of pattern. This is a shot he took just before it um, actually um, bloomed. And uh, prototyped the whole thing and, and tested it out. And it's something he's um, continuing to develop now. But I think what I really loved about this project was the sheer ambition that it didn't just stay as um, a speculative project, but he worked with um, people who landowners, a university, farmers, and so on, to actually test it um, all out. He also did another project, which some of you might have come across, called LA Pools, where he plotted, developed software to plot all the um, pools in LA and worked with some others. So um, a lot of the students are working with um, biotechnologies as well. And unlike um, electronics workshops, they're not so interesting. You know, you do some pipetting, you mix some things, you put it in an incubator or an oven overnight, come back the next day and it may or may not have, uh, have developed. So we try to get the students to do bio stuff hands-on so at least they can understand the principles and the realities and the procedures. But most of those projects tend to go into a much more speculative and futures orientation. Um, I think um, one of the things that comes up is the language of how these projects are presented. So this was one from a couple of years ago where she was very interested in 3D printing of organs. And something that isn't quite possible now, but is probably going to happen in, in the near future on a very small scale. But rather than just replacing existing organs, could we use that technology to print or make completely new organs? So these are um, backup organs or auxiliary organs. In this case, it's a defibrillator made from elements of um, electric eels that is inserted into the body. And when it detects the heart going through a kind of a dodgy phase, it, elect it sends a shock into the heart to kind of jolt it um, back again. But she spent a lot of time looking at how to present these things. At one point, she made them actually look quite realistic, but they, they just looked disgusting and, and unrealistic, just looked like dead meat. So she had to develop this sort of hyper-realistic way of modeling them. In phys she made them in real physical materials, like silicon. And um, made a really, this is a, a still from a video where these are being inserted um, into 
a human, which obviously in the film isn't a human but a pig. Um, so this is the defibrillator. This one um, takes elements from leeches and releases a, a coagulant into the blood to um, thin it for stroke victims. And this uses bits of a rattlesnake which can blast a phlegm out of the throat and, and the trachea. And um, the last one I'm going to talk about is this project which looks at um, what happens if, we, if the products that we make food with become biological devices. And uh, rather than cooking and baking and grilling, chemical processes are used to generate the various components of food, the, the nutrients, salts, and sugars that we need to survive. And she was very interested in trying to get away from the slightly gothic aesthetic that surrounds a lot of bio art. It's, it's all test tubes and bits of flesh and uh, liquids and fluids. Or like the last project, it goes a little bit kind of David Cronenberg. You know, it's all sort of uh, body parts. So she wanted to see what kind of language could suggest um, the types of interactions and aesthetics that might emerge from a biological um, approach rather than a digital home. Let's see if I can play this. On it goes. So, move on. Okay, I'm going to finish there. So, thank you very much. Of thinking about these these futures, and I guess one of the things is that since your program, in, in many ways, really set the standard for d graduate design education over the last ten to fifteen years. What do you think the next step is going to be, and are you going to be taking it, or <laughs> are others going to be taking it? Um. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I guess. I guess to clarify that, because mm. um, just what are the n sort of unex, if you were, th mm. since you've been thinking about the future of mm. design, now I'm going to ask you to think about the future of design education and sort of what are the open spaces that you think, you know, you, you talked about possibles, probables, mm. and yeah. preferables. And I guess I'd be really interested in what the preferables are for you right at this point in, in 2014. 
I think it's a kind of um, hybrid research design activity. I think RMA is already quite research. I think a lot of master's programs are already very research orientated, but you're limited by the length of the projects and the depth that can be explored. And so I think rather I just have no idea what new directions or possibilities will emerge or which program around the world you know, it's going to come from or who, which new ones are going to pop up and completely take us all in, in a new direction. But for us in Design Interactions, we're really trying to figure out how we can provide opportunities for the graduates to <laughs> somehow extend their work and go much deeper with it and take uh, maybe a little bit closer to reality after they graduate. So I think we're looking at some kind of um, post-postgraduate type of layer or laboratory that um, would let that happen. But I'm not really sure. I mean, weirdly, we just, stuff just happens. We, the, our course is structured in um, a very highly structured first year where we feed in what we know. And then a very open second year where the students kind of surprise us testing, um, testing, with the things testing. that they've discovered. Testing, and testing. then that in turn feeds into the first year. So really it depends also on the kinds of students we get and the sort of directions uh, they take us in. I, mean, I know I didn't really answer your question, but I can't. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hi, Tony. Hi. Thanks for coming. Um, and uh, thanks to the DLA at Design Media Arts for hosting this. Um, I'm wondering, I was thinking back to quite a few years ago, uh, a group in town called Heavy Garbage that was actually comprised of a bunch of <coughs> designers, of architects, stimulated a conversation by posting signs that were announcing the new Aqua Line, which was a subway line. And they actually have been credited by some as instigating the necessary conversation that brought about the sub subway line that's being built now that will actually come out to Santa Monica. I'm wondering, have any of the projects that you and Fiona have done or that have come out of the school stimulated a kind of debate that has actually impacted public policy? I think, um, I think uh, Fiona and I haven't really. Most of our work is directed into feeding back into kind of educational context methods and approaches and stuff like that. But some of our students have, but I, d I wouldn't say not so much in the public context, but in specialized disciplines and fields. So there's one um, graduate from a few years ago called Daisy Ginberg, Ginsberg, who's been having a really big impact within the synthetic biology world. In, I guess she's impacting mainly on, on how the scientists are seeing the future and implications of some of the work they're doing there. Um, it started originally through some work she did with another designer that dramatically showed some potential for some work being done in a very fictional way that since has now sparked real research into that area and um, some serious genetic engineering going on in that field. And probably the most de debate-worthy thing we did w actually had to be kept completely quiet. Um, we had a student who worked with a scientist over a four-week project and uh, came up with quite a kind of mischievous um, idea that the scientists tested and showed was actually possible. And when it surfaced, it um, turned out to be a very serious security threat um, to do with uh, forensics in policing. And it got passed on to the forensics lab at the um, Metropolitan Police and then got passed on to um, MI5 um, in the UK. And I never thought I'd be sitting at my desk reading through a report prepared by students for the Secret <laughs> Services, <laughs> analyzing the risks of the project and uh, sending it off. And it created an amazing debate around us about also the kind of ethics of your responsibilities that you might come up with ideas that are exciting and dramatic, but there's a line when they can actually be seriously um, harmful. And how you balance the fact that you're a free individual artistic person who should be able to express themselves, but if you presented this in public, and it's very easy to, for people in the know to figure out how this idea is put together, um, you could release information that would be really detrimental and you have to, in a way, stop it. So um, I think um, we often get asked what, you know, what the kind of impact of the work is. And I think the most interesting impacts happen through sort of almost like professional and, and disciplinary channels. Uh, and they seem, they create a lot of controversy and noise in the public space, but probably less impact along the lines of the example you, you've given. <laughs> 
guess you anticipated my question, which has to do with ethics. And uh, is there much talk uh, about ethics? Yes, um, a lot. Um, we have um, a, a bioethicist who comes in sometimes and uh, talks about issues with specific students whose projects are moving into difficult areas and also the basics for the students in general. But we also have a kind of professional ethics where there's two sides to it. One is related, I think, to your um, previous project was um, hoaxes. And uh, that was a positive hoax, it sounds like, that you mentioned, this kind of campaign. But a lot of the work can create these very negative, um, distorted um, perceptions on technology, the work scientists do, and so on. And the students can become implicated um, in these unwittingly. So we try to introduce them a way of how to conduct themselves when they're working with other groups and dealing with these fictions. And there's a, a kind of an aesthetic element in it and how you communicate that these are in fact ideas through the design of the imagery rather than making them too realistic. Um, but I think um, ethics is extremely important uh, for what we do uh, across the whole uh, spectrum of things. Well, ethics... Uh, is extremely important in every field, but yeah. it seems to be uh, ignored in a lot. Uh, the the uh, the the new uncrackable, uh, I guess, Apple, um, oh yeah, yeah. is is one one example. And I guess we're going to come up with many many more of those in the near future. Yeah, I think so. And I think our students are moving away from obvious dystopias or utopias as well, which causes other sorts of problems when sometimes they're not maybe, they're hedging their bets. You know, they can play the project two ways depending on uh, who their audience is. Is it a potential employer or a public context? And that's another kind of element in how they conduct themselves as professionals that we're trying to get to grips with as well. Yeah, it's, it's a big part of what we do. <laughs> Um, so, how how did you begin designing for speculative fiction, fictions? Um, you were talking about how you begin with a story, um, but how did that process come about for you? Um, the general process, you mean, or, or in a specific project? Right. Um, well, I guess you, you were saying you begin with a story, and then you design for the story yeah. after you come up with a brief. Um, how did you begin designing the story before you begin designing the actual objects? How did that process... How did you develop that process in the beginning? Well, we don't really design stories as such. You know, it's, it's zooming right in on alternative values. So um, you, know, you could build a story t to tie all those things together if you were, say, making a film or a video. You'd have to. But because we often just present the prop you know, the non for a non-existent film, we hope that the story unfolds in people's imaginations and different people looking at it will create different stories. But there isn't really the right vocabulary, I think, at the moment for unpicking, you know, narrative, story, scenario, script, um, synopsis, all these different elements that kind of overlap. Mm. So for us, we would purposefully try to choose, like if I give one example that I didn't show, it was a, a project we called a, um, a statistical clock. So it's an element that came out of the wall. It was done about six years ago, and it surfed the internet looking for um, news broadcasts of fatalities and accidents. And it would look at air disasters, car disasters, train disasters. And then when it f you could set the channel to one of those forms of transport. And then when it um, picked up on the information, it would speak out, uh, just count, you know, one, two, three, or something like that. In the room, you might be having dinner, or you might be just um, relaxing. And uh, we made that as a real prototype that actually worked uh, as part of a series. And uh, there's no market anywhere for that. <laughs> and we, we, you know, so there's no story either, but we started saying the kind of, it was almost maybe a what if. What if there was a place in the world for existential products that really prompted us to reflect on our lives and the things happening around us, just like sitting alongside a TV and a clock and a table. So that was the kind of starting point. And, and then we developed it, not trying to persuade anyone, you know, you should have one of these, or please invest in us so we can mass produce them. But to say, here's a gap between another version of today that's maybe more poetic and philosophical and the one we have. And what do we want to do about that gap? Is it okay? Should we be trying to close it? Um, can designers do anything about it? So that's, that's how we go about trying to create these alternatives.
And you could then, if we made a video scenario, we didn't, in this case, we just presented the prototypes. But if we uh, made a video scenario of that, probably then the story would have to come in to, to, to give a sense of who is this person, where is it happening. And that's then where, all th where a lot of problems start as well, because, oh, it's the future. And it, therefore, it must be an extension of, the m of today, but it doesn't seem to make sense. I don't get this project, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, when you step outside of the whole futures thing, you, you can open up a very different um, discussion space, I think. Um, hello. Um, I had a question about what kind of institutions or entities support that kind of student work afterwards. You've mentioned laboratories and yeah. working with galleries. But do you have any other examples? Yeah, in, the, in England, there's a very interesting organization called the Wellcome Trust, who fund, um, again, it's, it's like the government funding body. They put three quarters of a million pounds a year into research, uh, mainly in biomedical um, stuff. And they have a fantastic um, arts and design program where they commission projects, individuals, they do residencies. And several of our graduates have received funding to develop projects. And it really helps people kind of you know, launch their careers um, in that direction. Um, in academic yeah, context, there are um, you know, labs in the universities where, again, you can apply for traditional um, grants. And some people set up studios where they do they work with clients and charge for it, even though it's still experimental, and then use the kind of profits to um, subsidize um, their own work. But it's still, it's hard. It's hard, you know, there, there are not lots of opportunities, but each year that goes by, and again, I'm speaking from uh, really the UK, there are uh, increasing numbers of opportunities uh, for this kind of work. But one of the reasons we keep our program so small is, you know, we don't want to flood it. At the moment, there's like an ecosystem, and a certain number of graduates come out. There seems to be the right number of opportunities. They all work together to kind of help each other figure stuff out, um, rather than you, you, if you do too much of that, um, everyone gets hyper competitive and starts, to, you know, the whole network thing starts to break down. But even within companies, I'm, I'm really surprised at the opportunities that are there. Um, once you move away from the production end um, and really thinking about the next, you know, interactive watch or whatever the next few years. If you're working in the, c in the research labs of Microsoft, for example, they have really great labs in Cambridge in England, there are all sorts of, of interesting things going on. And not just about developing um, new technologies, but how those technologies will impact on our lives. But again, you, you have to be quite persuasive to you know, persuade a, an engineering company like that to um, take a designer on board. So I think um, a long way <laughs> around is, there are an increasing number of opportunities, but being able to capitalize on them is a whole set of other skills, you know, being able to tell stories. It's not like they look at your work and just go, wow, this is amazing. We want to commission you. Being able to frame the work and talk about its, its relevance and value and its usefulness, I think is almost as important as being able to produce really great work. Hey. Thanks for joining us. Um, I enjoy your work a lot. Um, my question is kind of a bit of an extension of where you just went with your answer, actually. Um, speaking more to, you know, it's amazing that through your work and the work of others, there's, there's kind of this space that's being carved for speculations. Um, and ultimately, I'm quite interested in the idea of, you know, whose responsibility ultimately is it to enact such things? Um, one opportunity, obviously, is within the private sector and people working within research labs. Um, but until there is some kind of a viable path for people to pursue the pursue these projects to their logical conclusions, it was really interesting to see the Benedict Gross project in the sense that he managed to actually do that. Um, are we kind of ceding that responsibility to um, a private industry that is not kind of incentivized to mm. <laughs> challenge themselves? Um, I've seen this within the field of futures, too, where it seems very popular to, to fund these wonderful research projects, but it almost seems in a sense like uh, you know, a false alternative is being funded there. It's kind of just appeasing speculation versus actually adopting it. And so I wonder if you have any thoughts as to that next step of, you know, mm. um, and what line is crossed when a designer starts to assume the role of tool builder, marketeer, or yeah. business owner? You know, um, what line is crossed there? I think that's a really good question, um, a really complex one too, <laughs> so I'm not going to be able to deal with all aspects of it. 
But I think there is a kind of assumption that by offering an alternative, the person offering the alternative is hoping that it could be realized. But that's absolutely not the case with, say, the work Fiona and I do. It is with some of our students. I can come back to that in a minute. We kind of believe, I guess what we buy into and, and want to contribute to is a cultural landscape where we're presented with all sorts of alternatives to the dominant consensual reality that's forced upon us. And adding more dimensions and variations and shades of reality that will loosen, I think, our minds and make us more open to going in different directions. So we see our work more like a, a catalyst uh, along with people who write stories and make films. And we're interested as designers saying, uh, as designers, are we or should we just stick to solving problems and making nice products? Or can we join into this really interesting um, space of culture making and contribute to it in a different way? So for us, there isn't a next step. Once they're released, and if they are engaging people and stimulating and opening people's minds uh, or maybe you know, people coming back and critiquing our work, that's it. it. It's it's fine. That's what we want. But there are other students where that you know, like yourself, that isn't enough. And so they're experimenting with setting up new kinds of practices and studios, working not necessarily with industry. I'm thinking of one called Superflux. Uh, yeah, that came out of our program a few years ago, and they tried to team up with government organisations and other groups and lean a little bit more to a public side of things. Um, and they, but again, I'm not sure if they would really, it's like there's this big thing with utopia, you know, people assume if you set up a utopia, the idea is we've now got to implement it. Whereas another theory of utopia is it's a kind of, um, it's a direction that we'll never reach that sort of focuses our minds on something more idealistic and uh, perhaps better than the existing reality. Because if you did achieve it, you know, the cliche of one person's utopia is another person's um, hell. And so, I think there's a really interesting space in there about what should and shouldn't be realized. And I think it's very important with individual designers that they're clear about whether, like you suggest, it's important to go beyond and try to implement it, and therefore how do you do that? Because otherwise the speculations would be seen as, as just a failure or a you know, halfway. Or the space Fiona and I like to work in, where the speculation is the end result, and it's the people's interactions and mental interpretations of it that that we're interested in. I think because of the uh, kind of design, the way that you and Fiona approach design, and as I was saying in the introduction, in a in a very unique way, this even this notion of the speculation and to me it seems like an important role for artists and designers to take on that we don't see enough of so I really appreciate your presence here and to kind of open our eyes to ways of thinking about design the future dystopia and utopia um, I, I was wondering too with it I know when tech the world of technology was coming of age there was a lot of utopia. It was all mm -hmm. good, and you know, Wired Magazine, everything is great, the future is wonderful, and it all because of technology. And do you see that students and designers are seeing more of a dystopia, that they're, have you noticed any kind of switch with the, the mm -hmm. future the, of technology and bio biology, that it's changing, or? I, I don't know, I mean, again, if I just look at the narrow little world I'm in, you know, with our students, um, we just ran a small project, uh, an introductory project for the students to get to know each other over three weeks, and they had to design a parallel tour of London where they had to imagine a, an alternative London but use the real London as the setting and make props and things to take us on the tour, and they're all dystopian. Mm. And we were really surprised. Uh, we were <laughs> wondering why. But, and I think if Fiona and I... Um, maybe in our own work are trying to move away from simply critiquing stuff and, and pointing out all the limitations to trying to find opportunities. But I think with our students, they still seem to be looking more at what's wrong with the world and either exaggerating it or um, playing with it or amplifying it. But I'm not sure you know, generally if that's the case. But I, I think some of them are worried that maybe if they are propose something optimistic, it could be seen maybe as naive. Um, yeah, we're naive 
people not too yeah, long ago. Yeah, I mean, pers personally, I don't mind naivety. I think that, you know, things, you know, they can start naive, they don't have to stay naive, but I think there's a fear of, of being maybe yeah. labeled. Yeah. Better to be a bit cynical and uh, <laughs> <laughs> cool. Naive, right? yeah. <laughs> well, great. So if we could thank Anthony for coming by, and we'll have more of his visit with grad students. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.